Now I'd like to shift us up to talking about uh, a business level uh, use case that has really emerged over the last year. Uh, and that is that of central bank digital currencies. Uh, there's probably no topic that's hotter uh, among central bankers these days uh, with so many banks announcing pilots, announcing research projects, organizations uh, uh, of all sorts that are involved in this, um, announcing uh, different, different initiatives and looking to the underlying technologies that we've been using in the enterprise blockchain space, not just for inspiration, but to actually build and deploy on. So I'm very happy here to be hosting a panel uh, with two very distinguished guests, uh, if I can bring them on screen. Uh, uh, the first is Her Excellency Saray Che, uh, who uh, is the Assistant Governor for the National Bank of Cambodia, uh, and as well as Subnendu Mohanty, who is the Chief FinTech Officer for the Monetary Authority of Singapore. These are two organizations that have been pioneers in this space, uh, uh, who have had research projects and now deployments uh, built on this technology. Uh, and, and I'm really looking forward to, to getting to know their projects better, to share more of that with you, but also start to really dig in on what's needed to, to meet this challenge. So why don't I pause and Suray, um, could you share with the audience uh, just a little bit more about what Cambodia has done, what the National Bank of Cambodia has built uh, and, and, and you know the, what, what you build upon and what success you've had with it? Thank you, Brian, uh, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone uh, in the audience. I'm very glad to represent the minority here, the women speakers and also non-white. Um, so I, I am Assistant Governor of the National Bank of Cambodia, and recently the NBC uh, introduced a project called Project Back Home, uh, which is um, the backbone payment system. Now, I think you refer to it as CBDC. Um, you can call it whatever you want, but to us, it's a backbone payment system. Um, so this system use uh, Hyperledger IROHA. Um, it's a system that we co-developed with a Japanese company called Suramitsu. Um, but how it works is that it, it, is, it provides a universal application for everyone in the public to download. Um, and once downloaded, uh, they have to register themselves with uh, one of the member bank in Bako. Um, and so they choose the registration with the member bank. Um, and then they can top up the wallet. With the, so the application itself is a wallet. Um, and then they can top up the money uh, into the wallet uh, by uh, sending money from their existing bank account. And if they don't have a bank account, they can top up with cash uh, at any bank branches or at any uh, agent. Uh, so a banking agent, uh, for many of you who's not familiar, it's, it's actually uh, kind of like a human ATM uh, where their, their only function is to uh, disperse cash to whoever needed. And it's very popular in developing countries. It's required less uh, um, resources, particularly in terms of electricity. So if you go to a remote area where you don't have, uh, you know, uh, stable supply of electricity, plugging an ATM machine could require a lot. So, um, so anyone can go to an agent and top up their wallet. And once the money in, is in the wallet, they can send it uh, to uh, any other wallet holder or to any uh, of the bank account holder and vice versa. The second uh, feature of this Bacom project is the uh, interoperability part where um, people who don't have a Bacom wallet, uh, they can still use their existing banking uh, application and send money to any other uh, bank account holder um, through the backbone, uh, the Bacom backbone. And so this is where uh, inter interoperability is uh, created. So far, we have about um, 100,000 download of the wallets, but in terms of uh, the people that we reached um, and indirectly used by Gong, uh, we reached about 5 million users. Um, and uh, so this, this wallet exists both in US dollars, uh, where Cambodia is a dollarized economy, um, and also in real, which is the local currency. 
That's that's fascinating. Uh, great. Why don't I uh, pass the mic to Sobnendu? Um, Sobnendu, could you tell us more about uh, what the Monetary Authority of Singapore has done in this space and uh, some of the recent announcements that that you've made? Sure. Uh, by the way, good morning, good afternoon uh, to all the audience today. And it's always a uh, great opportunity to speak on an open source platform, which we truly believe. As a central bank, we always believe that more open source, better for the community and and what you've done is remarkable over the last few years in uh, getting getting from a from all of us from this questionable that blockchain is looking for a problem to solve. I think now we have changed the gear a lot, uh, and now it is a real solution for a real problems in what we deal with, uh, with with things around us. So uh, MAS uh, started its own journey about understanding the technology in 2016 uh, through our own uh, experiment called Project Ubin. Uh, Ubin is a, is a name given to a program where we brought uh, different uh, DLT platform together. And we took a use case, uh, which central banks are comfortable with, which is called payments. And, and then try to implement this technology and understand, can we make it better than what we have today? And this project went through a five, five phase uh, process over three years. Now it's going 2020 and, and we told ourselves that we want to stop this experiment in 2019, last year, and we promised to everybody that it will it will not stay as an experiment forever. It will go into a production grade something. Uh, we didn't know that something what it means in 2016. It was still experimenting. Well, I'm not going to bore your audience with what happened in Ubin because this, this is widely publicized. The reports are out there. Essentially, just to summarize, we spent time from a policy standpoint, from a technology understanding point of view, trying to see is there a possibility to make things better than it stands today? And we kind of came out of the whole exercise with one clear outcome. Yes, the DLT platform truly can solve the settlement issue. And how do you go about it? That there is a play for a wholesale CBDC. While, um, while uh, uh, Sherrod uh, will not acknowledge the, her as a retail CBDC, and she will constantly pitch it as a uh, as a payment solution, I think this is rightfully rightfully done that uh, and, and there's a right position from her context. But there is a play for retail CBDC, which I will come later. Let's talk about the wholesale CBDC. Yes, with a wholesale CBDC construct, with a DLT construct, there is a possible opportunity to redesign the whole ledger system, especially when you're settling cross-border. Now, mm -hmm. I'll, I will switch back at the back and forth on different experience here. Now, same time, 2016, 2017, we did a almost identical a parallel experiment of taking the existing infrastructure we had in Singapore, which is a faster payment system, and try to connect to an equivalent system in Thailand, uh, which has, they have their equivalent of faster payment system. And we see whether we can connect them cross-border and see where it goes. It took us three years to connect those two systems. We went live this, this year. And there are a few outcomes we saw there. First thing, we brought down the cost of transfer between Singapore and Thailand from average 10 to 15% to down to 3%. There's a significant reduction. Remember, I'm sending money through a trusted banking rails, not through a remittance system, which is outside the banking system, if at all. But there are, uh, within regulated space, not through normal uh, public rails like fast opening system. Now, we still are stuck in the 3%, 5% cost, and primarily because of two things, FX and the settlement cost. That's where the beauty of a wholesale currency plus a DLT-based shared ledger could make it a, make a big difference. And if we can collectively bring down the 3% cost to a sub-dollar cost for transfer, I think the, I, I, at least I'm going to pitch to the hyperledger community, help us to get there, and you have truly contributed a significant inclusion agenda by bringing down the cost of cross-border at the sub-dollar cost. And to do that, if it takes a DLT-based architecture, it, it takes a wholesale CBDC, it takes a whole, whole new way of settling, uh, I think we should go and do it. I think that's where we believe the real opportunity lies. So that's the DLT uh, wholesale currency. Now, shifting the gear a little bit on Singapore again, the reason I talk about the two system because we finished the experiment, we saw the real result of connecting the standard tech stack, we still had a 3% problem. Now let's talk about how you can solve the 3%. So we, uh, as the end of the project to win, 
uh, the success of the experiment kind of ended up in creating an industry architecture or a, or a, a company called Partier, jointly uh, uh, launched by DBS, JP Morgan, and Temasek. And they created an in industry utility, a blockchain-based platform, which enables participants around the world to transact on real time using different currencies, digital currencies, uh, central, uh, uh, commercial banks' digital currency. Now, the idea behind is that, can we create a shared ledger uh, or a multi-currency construct and help to automatically settle uh, uh, transactions? And that platform is what Partier is bringing. Also further downstream, that can also help to design smart contracts. If there's a DeFi based use case, they can also facilitate that. But what I'm trying to end, uh, summarize here that this whole experiment ended up in a production grade, a commercial enterprise called Partier, trying to solve a real issue around transfer settlement and multi-currency uh, cost structures, which can be significantly made better than what is done today. So that's uh, Partier as, a, as an outcome. Sim same time, we also saw, just a minute, we also saw that we kind of uh, 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 saw a massive revolution in Singapore in terms of number of blockchain companies coming and solving the issues in different ways. We are now close to 200 blockchain companies in Singapore alone. They occupy 15% of our fintech portfolio. So such a massive growth has come in this space. And, that, and as an outcome of that, they're solving issues around uh, trade finance. Uh, uh, that they're solving issues around uh, uh, our own exchanges settlement uh, uh, processes. Uh, 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 in fact, there are many examples today in Singapore where uh, we have used DLT-based platform for uh, bond issuance and uh, digital asset issuance. So there are a whole set of commercial enterprise coming through, not only by fintechs, also by mainstream banks, the, the DBS and et cetera, which clearly shows that blockchain has become mainstream. And once it has become mainstream, this technology is no more a fun. It's a real serious platform to think about. And I wish that uh, Hyperledger community continue to play in this space and help us to solve real problems. Wow, that's a that's a great message, Satnandu. Thanks. Let me actually um, pivot this uh, uh, that that observation back to Saray. So, uh, what role did open source software play in choosing a platform for Project Bakong? Um, uh, and and you know how important was it that Hyperledger Aroha was open source? Uh, and does that play an ongoing role as you think about evolving that platform? Uh, is the fact that it's open source relevant? Um. It's, it's getting a bit technical. I, I, um, I may not be able to answer it perfectly, but my understanding from my IT is that it's the, the reason why we selected IROHA in the first place was because it was written in a, in a language that our team could understand and which, which was the Java language. So that was a very important part in our selections. Um, but I, so that's that's probably what I can answer from a <laughs> technical perspective. But I, I just want to pick up from what Subnandu mentions about CBDC. Um, I mean, if, if we if we if we think that currency and money are in interchangeable term, uh, then money by definition has three function, which is a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value. And so when we introduced Bacom, we didn't intend to reinvent money in itself because in terms of the store of value, you know, we're, we're happy with what one real represent and one US dollars represent. We were happy um, with the store of value, but we wanted to reinvent the way people make uh, payment. And, and that's why we insist on calling it a, a payment system. Um, if you look at, if, if you want to recreate the concept of, of money, that would mean that people can use the money, the, the, the digital form that, that Bakong uh, introduced uh, to earn money, um, right? To save and to lend as well, uh, because that is what money is about. And this is not the, 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 the area that we wanted to venture into because it would imply a lot of complication for monetary policies and, and others. So we want to stick to the fact that the reason why we make it electronic, it's because we want to make payment easier. We want to make cross-border payment easier. And that's the only reason why we, we stick to backbone payment system. But in terms of calling it a central bank digital currency, there are some, some features in, in Bakong that could be, um, I mean, people can, can call it central bank digital currency. Technology 
wise it is, but legal wise, uh, from a legal perspective, it is not. So technology is because it is peer to peer. Um, it is because it's uh, introduced by the central bank. So anyone who wants to transact through the Bakong platform must first exchange their fiat money with the central bank uh, against the, the, the digital form of it. Um, and the, the thing with it is that we only uh, do this kind of transaction with financial institutions. We don't deal directly with the public. And so the central bank don't have any liability, direct liability to the public. And in a way it, it, it sort of distinguish this CBDC feature uh, from the payment feature that we were mentioning. I see. No, it's uh, the term CBDC has been used very widely. I think the uh, the China's central bank digital currency takes a very different kind of view of, of what one would call a, a CBDC. I think the association people have is, you know, to see a government uh, of any sort, whether it's, you know, the US or, or European or, or, or Cambodia, uh, uh, you know, saying here's a technology platform. And it's a technology platform for exchanging units of value, right? Um, is an extraordinary thing. I, I typically that's thought of as the thing that's left to private the private sector or left to you know people like Swift or that or that something like that, right? So uh, I think it's really really interesting to see a tech uh, a government take a very forward kind of uh, position on this. Uh, uh, and so I think that's 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 what's been wrapped up in CBDC. I, I think even if it's not quite a, a digital currency, but um, I think it's intended. Uh, to be to be uh, uh, you know an honorific you know to be to be something to speak highly of so and, and now that I remember I want to mention the reason why we uh, select this hyperledger or, or peer to peer uh, for this system and this is because when you look at how payment system payment and settlement is done in a banking system is that the central bank will hold a centralized um, system and all settlement interbank settlement will go through the central bank system. And every member banks will then have to have a settlement account, a credit line with the bank in case, with the central bank in case, you know, they can't settle. Um, and so th there's a lot of liquidity management required from member bank to be a member of the central clearing house. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to bring in, the problem with our fragmented system was that we have so many type of institutions. We have the payment service provider, which we regulate more like a technology provider. And we have banks, which we regulate as banks. And then we have microfinance institution, which are the, the regulation is at much lesser extent. And so because we wanted to bring everyone onto the same platform, one way we could do this is that bring the payment service provider who, who provide wallets uh, onto the central clearinghouse which means that they will have to comply with the same liquidity management uh, rules as banks. And that's been the whole purpose of making their, the, the, the mobile payment cheaper than banks because the regulatory compliant costs. And so what we come up with with that, okay, let, how about peer-to-peer, -peer, which is the, the, the payment service provider don't have to be a member of Central Clearinghouse as long as they have their back home credit as long as their user has back home credit, they can transfer to anyone they want because it's peer to peer. It won't go to the central uh, system and we won't have to monitor their liquidity positions on a daily basis, on hourly basis. And in a way, I think it is very important for us uh, that how you know this new system uh, can contribute to uh, bringing everyone on the same platform and, and also reduce risk. It reduces risk. It's essentially uh, continuously self-auditing in a way, or self-monitoring. Uh, uh, it's, it's. I think that's one of the key, the, the key advantages, the opportunity to collapse a couple of layers of the stack that that typically we have there, or reduce some intermediaries. Um, so, Nindu, uh, uh, recent projects that have launched uh, uh, um, fr from MAS or that you've been involved in have spoken to MCBDCs, uh, this concept of having a common ledger for uh, a number of different central bank digital currencies or, or, or units of payment. Um, do you think that's a that's a trend that will grow? I mean, do you think at some point, like like uh, the majority of the world's central bank currencies will be on a small number of, of common ledgers? Uh, or do you think, uh, I mean, what's, what does the shape of, of kind of the space look like over time if some of these, uh, the, these projects are successful? Sure. Uh, Brian, I think that's the genesis of that definitely is all Ubins and the experiment Canada did on Jasper 
I think they all talked about a ledger which can be shared. And so in a multi-ledger construct, multi-currency, multi-ledger construct, definitely is the way forward. And if indeed the future of cross-border settlement will be multi-currency, I think there's a need to think about a shared ledger central banks can work with. And, and then that ledger doesn't need a debit credit and whole settlement going between different countries. Can they share something among themselves? And that can be used. And that's what Project Dunbar of BIS uh, uh, Bank of Vietnam Settlement in Singapore Hub is doing. And that exactly is trying to build, trying to build a model where which central banks can think about a shared ledger, multi-currency, multi-CBDC ledger, and then use that infrastructure as a service as a service, I want to be very, very particular about that as a service, then where different provider can use that service to do the commercial bank and use that service to do the payment uh, transfer. So, so the operational uh, resiliency remains uh, decoupled uh, and only this particular ledger becomes a service where it can be used to settle among domestic currencies and hence make the process easier. So your big question is, yes, is that a trend? And I, I, if I'm not mistaken, and, uh, and please, if I have quote a wrong number, the 100 plus experiments around this whole uh, CBDC piece going around in different shapes and sizes. I think, uh, uh, I think that is, that is the trend. And um, I, I think in my, pers my perspective, central banks have, find, have, have kind of came a long way to, to, uh, to, to kind of uh, reconcile that there is a play for a DLT-based shared ledger as a way to redesign your settlement system, whether for domestic settlement for securities and payment or for international settlement of securities and payment. I think that's mm. kind of a, a strengthening conclusion. Well, what, what is uh, this paint for institutions that are traditional intermediaries? I'm thinking of, you know, obviously SWIFT, but, but what about the BIS? I mean, uh, um, what, I mean not, not that I'm asking you to speculate on, on the, their futures, but um, if trend lines continue, what, what might we expect? There's still, still an infrastructure. It's still an infrastructure play. Uh, yeah. The central bank will play the governance role. Uh, I think they have to play the governance role. And it's not, it's a permission ledger, let me put it this way. So it's not a permission, permissionless uh, system. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so I think the role of governance will not go away. Yeah, it still remains. Uh, it is the infrastructure. Until infrastructure becomes far more atomic in in nature. Yeah, still so still room for some intermediaries to try to make it easier to integrate these and systems. Governance, safety, uh, safety, soundness uh, will remain there uh, at least for at least for now. Uh, right. Right. You cannot say in future what will happen, but at least my perspective is that uh, there'll be a tech shift, but governance will become central to that. Interesting. We had one question which came about, uh, just somebody really curious about which DLT platforms are used underneath uh, some of these different solutions. I think we established that uh, underneath Project Back Kong is Hyperledger Aroha, which is cool. Uh, I know that uh, uh, MAS, uh, the with Project Ubin, you did kind of a bake-off between yeah. Fabric and Ethereum uh, and Quorum, uh, or Corda, sorry, and Corda at the time. Yes. Uh, and uh, I know you've continued to research all three of these. Um, yes, can you yes. talk a little bit about uh, uh, what what you know of the different different uh, differences in your evaluation well, actually, of the platform? In fact, we, we were trying to force the issue that whether whatever difference exists, please solve the interoperability issue. It's almost a reverse that you may have a differences, but can I simultaneously check with the different platform for interoperability perspective uh, yeah. for able to talk to each other? So in, in fact, it's not doesn't matter whether there are differences. But as a central bank, we expect them to do certain uh, core principle of interoperability. And that's right. what was forced in Ubin. So differences may still there, but at least when they talk to each other, uh, there, was a, there was an interoperability which was tested as part of the program. Okay. Having said that, in the defense of, uh, in the promotion of Hyperledger, we are, uh, uh, I just want to bring uh, to your audience that uh, hopefully by end of this month, we will announce, uh, announce a, a massive, perhaps the biggest uh, hackathon ever done in the space of uh, uh, a retail CBDC, where we got uh, economists and policymakers to actually put their problem statement. And Hyperledger is going to be one of our key partners there uh, to, to provide that infrastructure and service 
so that we get the best brain to solve those issues. And my sense is that as an outcome of that huge experiment, we may actually provide a real case for many emerging market, many countries who can't afford traditional faster payment system, traditional payment infrastructure, even making their own currency, uh, own, own system efficient, uh, they may find retail CBDC with this infrastructure and a compelling argument uh, for them to switch. In Singapore, I may not have a compelling argument because I can move money between two bank accounts at zero cost at in three clicks. But uh, there are countries which still needs a lot of infrastructure investment and they can live for like Cambodia. Yeah. Well, we're very uh, eager to collaborate with you on the hackathon. And as you know, um, you know both Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Bezu uh, yeah. have been are being used in pilots out there uh, around CBDCs and obviously Aroha too. Uh, yeah. It'd be great to see Aroha uh, pick up a, I mean, uh, again, national payment systems, not CBDC, apologies, uh, Sarai. Um, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it'll be really great to, to see how we might uh, you know tap into the innovation and energy that's in our ecosystem and, and start to apply to these big challenges. Sorry, Brian, I was, I, but one thing I want to say that in the whole uh, uh, infrastructure, the one sector which has truly taken off big time switching the infrastructure is the trade finance piece. You go and ask any trade finance companies, any bank which is doing trade finance, that you ask one question, what technology architecture you want to ship, it will be a blockchain-based architecture. So mm. that one sector within financial sector has really taken off is the trade finance piece. No, that's that's long been a big uh, deployment uh, uh, kind of use case for for hyperledger technologies and and very big in China uh, as well. That's that's the source of a lot of their 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 work. We'll hear a bit more from the China Construction Bank uh, in a keynote on Thursday. So really looking forward to that. Um, I, let's see. I, so um, one of the, the 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 questions that has emerged in central bank digital currencies is obviously uh, how KYC and AML processes are affected by it. Uh, and there's some who think uh, are asking, could central banks be a way to also get to a new approach to digital identity? Uh, uh, well, there's a lot of technologies in the blockchain space for kind of reinventing how digital identity might work. You might be familiar with self-sovereign identity. Um, I, have either of you seen that come up as a, as a use case? And what are your some thoughts about what happens over the next uh, year or two uh, with that? Uh, yes. Um, so you want me to go or should I? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go, I... so, so, well, let me let me context this question. It's a very good question. And thanks for asking this question to, uh, to us. We recently did an internal study on how the future of finance will look like. Out of the three or four things which kind of landed, we, we think there's a huge future of finance around decentralized finance. And one of the and, and to, to, to get there, one of the key component is identity, the digital identity. And here is the challenge because there is a two, there are two schools of thought. In some countries like Singapore, India, there's a massive push to build national digital ID programs, whether for corporates or individuals. And in many countries, it's almost reversed. There could be an identity run by private sector, self-sovereign identity, and different construct like that. In either case, there's a need to have a robust, agreed digital identity construct representing a company or an individual. So that's given if you want to go in that space, because mm -hmm. typical DeFi will need as a, with a smart contract. We need two or three things. It, not, it must have a trusted ID. It must have a codified regulation recognized by the legal framework in the country. And of course, the underlying architecture, the, the digital currency, which powers them. And so, so, the, the, so, the, so the, the discussion we are having now is not only recognizing this ID within the country, can it be recognized outside the country? So there is this huge need to start the debate, not only for, uh, for the digital finance use case, also or smart contracts in this case, also for the case of even doing a simple uh, KYC based on digital products. So digital KYC based on digital identity is being discussed. What really uh, has to come up strongly is countries who prefer self-sovereign IDs or some kind of de decentralized ID. How do they come up with the good ideas in use case? And I, I have seen some use case, but they're very designed for a particular uh, condition like refugees uh, on the use case, those kind, of, uh, those kind of use cases, but not at a national or at a level where a decentralized ID is being uh, developed. 
but definitely it's a very critical component to be discussed and sorted out. Suray, do you think uh, Project Bakong uh, serves as kind of a, uh, a gateway to doing other national digital identity uh, uh, projects or, or tackling other ID related use cases uh, for Cambodia? Yeah, we, we're currently exploring this because in Cambodia, the way it works is that everyone has a national ID number and it is registered with our Ministry of Interior. So they've got a big database um, of, of, you know, uh, of the people there. And so what we're trying to, to do is that when people register on the Bakong platform, can we access to those database um, and verify uh, the people immediately against the official database and, and get it moving uh, faster? Um, currently, we have too many layers. It's, it's tiered layers because we want to promote financial inclusion. So if you just download, enter your phone number and take a picture of yourself and your ID, it gives you a certain level of access. Uh, but you, if you want to increase the amount that you're able to transfer across, uh, then you need to physically be present at the bank branch where they do, you know, these uh, conventional KYC. And we, we think that, you know, in this day and age when COVID is uh, prevalent, uh, it is best that we limit contacts. And so now we're working with um, uh, the Cambodian Data Exchange Center, where we can, uh, which, which gathered all the, uh, uh, pool all the government uh, data um, and see whether we can access directly to the, the, the ID database. Um, but this is what we, um, we hope can, uh, can be rolled out soon. We're also exploring cross-border. Um, again, when we were talking, I mean, it's, it's good to have a digital currency that you can send across border. And I, I think in fact, um, this is probably one of the most useful case of digitalizing your currency in the first place is that you allow cross-border faster. But that's assumed that the other country would also have the same uh, system in place. Um, and in our case, we actually try to uh, um, connect the backbone platform, which is a, which is a, a, a DLT base, with a conventional platform from a Malaysian uh, commercial bank, um, Maybank. So um, there's, there's a lot of challenges, uh, particularly uh, in the uh, digital identity, um, but we hope we can overcome it and launch it within this year. Yeah, I think interconnecting interconnections between central banks uh, uh, and and the the payment rails uh, interconnection, uh, you know, on a global scale. I mean, this is something I know is on the minds of folks who are working on the interoperability initiatives at at Hyperledger. Uh, uh, how do we make that as seamless as efficient so we can bring the cost down? Subnendo, to your point, you want to bring it really below one dollar, which I think is fabulous uh, as a way to to expand uh, 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 access to that. Um, and and I think uh, the uh, the Bakong project is a great example as well of expanding access beyond the, the people who are part of the traditional banking system. So I want to thank both of my guests. Again, Her Excellency Suray Che uh, from the National Bank of Cambodia, Subdendu uh, Mohanty uh, from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Thank you both for an amazing panel on the application of these technologies uh, to what is probably <laughs> the, the use case at the, at the top of the pyramid in the financial system. So uh, thank you both. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks.